This is Dom Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcast that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode number 23. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all of the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. But today we're discussing the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, Encounter at Four... Encounter at Far Point. Not Four Point. Far Point. <laughs> I have no idea where Four Point is, but they didn't encounter them there. Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Great. This was the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. It was a two-part episode at the time. I don't know if you remember. Um, mm -hmm. It runs now, if you look, if you watch it on, say, Netflix or whatever, it runs about 90 minutes, I think it is. Um, right. Yeah, it's right at an hour and a half. So um, this is another one of those uh, uh, stories that got fiddled with a little bit uh, in production. A, a little. <laughs> <laughs> when a I say lot. A, when I say a little bit, I mean yeah. a lot, yeah. Uh, the writing of it was, like, when you read the story of how this ended up in its final form, uh, written in its final form, it is just, it's just crazy complicated. But basically, DC and, Fontaine... And that, that's, that's not unusual for pilot episodes, because there's right. so much, you know, stress uh, at behind the scenes of the producers. We've got to get this right out the gate. We've got to attract our audience. Everything's got to be just perfect. You've got the writers trying to do their thing, the producers trying to do their thing, the yeah. studio with all of its input. Yeah, you got new actors playing new characters who yeah. they're trying to figure their way. Um, and what one of the things that happened is Paramount wanted a two-parter. Um, and Gene Roddenberry wanted it to be a one part. Um, Which and, is what the original Star Trek pilots were for the first series. Mm -hmm. They were one parters. Right. And uh, Roddenberry kind of fought him on that. And they had a script uh, written by DC Fontana, who was the script editor eventually on uh, the original Star Trek and was now on the, the production team here. And it was basically the far point mystery that we have here. Right. No and Q. No Q. Q was not in it. Right. And so when when the head of Paramount eventually strong-armed Roddenberry, one story says he threatened to throw Roddenberry off the lot if he didn't do what he said, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, is funny. I mean, that, uh, and, and that is not beyond the realm of possibility that that happened. Um, Roddenberry, Roddenberry was notoriously hostile towards studios. Yes, and very stubborn, uh, uh, infamously stubborn. And so he came up with this Q plot, this Q frame story that goes around it. Um, now, there was some, uh, initially some uh, pushback against it, I, I gather, uh, from some of the other writers who saw it as a ripoff of the Trelane story from the original series, Squire mm. of Gothos, which has been yeah. retconned, by the way, that Trelane must have been a Q, which is kind of fun to... Yeah, it's that's in in some fan and fan canon and in the uh, in the uh, novelizations novelizations, yeah. but it is hasn't made its way on screen. Yeah, yeah, the, but uh, I just think it's kind of funny how. But but Q it, is a, a lot like Trelane. I mean, he's prancing around in these military uniforms from days of yore, and yes. you know, talking as if he's you know. Initially, he's talking as if he's a guy, a military guy from centuries ago, 
and he's he's impish and a jerk. Yeah, yeah. right, right. <laughs> and, and that's that comes across so much more in this one. Actually, I found like Q eventually becomes a lot more playful and almost regards uh, Picard as kind of his pal that he's. Like this, I was going to say annoying, Pat. Uh, or Pat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but well, certainly, he, he becomes almost comic relief. Yes. At, especially going into Voyager. Oh, yeah. You know. But here, he's very aggressive and hostile, uh, even in his capriciousness. And not the he's not the fun cue of later. Mm -mm. He is uh, he's very much a a, uh, a malevolent cue. And I mean, he's a lot like a. A Loki character, Loki from mm -hmm. Norse uh, mythology, uh, not necessarily from Marvel Cinematic Universe, which ruins the, the discussion <laughs> of, of Norse mythology. Sorry, but yeah, I'm a fan of uh, the MCU, but it, it's hard to talk about Nor Norse gods now. Uh, so, uh, uh, so it's just a very interesting like backstory to how this got created, and eventually. A lot of the people involved in the production agreed that the Q story, like, and I know, Jimmy, your opinion is different, and we can just talk mm -hmm. about it. But they they thought the Q story was the best part of this episode. Uh, <laughs> I, well, in relative terms, maybe. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, personally, I would have rather seen seen DC Fontana's original script produced without the way it got messed with, because DC Fontana is a good writer. Yes. Um, and she has a real good sense of Star Trek and what it can be. And Gene Roddenberry is notorious or was notorious for messing with people's scripts. In fact, her next script, which became The Naked Now, she actually took her name off of right uh because Roddenberry turned it into a into a sex comedy that it was not meant to be at all right wait wait a, a creator of a massive uh world and science fiction uh, enter enterprise ruining it later we don't know any <laughs> other you know sci-fi worlds that that happens do we if gene roddenberry were alive today would he be messing with the uh the old episodes and redoing them perhaps yeah. uh yeah uh, and we'll talk more about naked now as we go along that's that'll be coming up of course uh so that get that to look forward to uh well the one of the things uh like with dc fontana is at in the end, they as it's a matter of course when there's massive rewrites, they send them off to the uh, screenwriters guild. I forget exactly right what it's for Some, arbitration, right? And they decide who you know what how the credits work, and they did decide that they get equal crediting, equal billing on the script as uh, co as co writers of the script. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, they they decided he did enough changes to right. merit that, um, so that he he now get you know or his estate now gets the. The residuals for it. Um, so, one of the other things that that I notice about this sort of the, about the episode in general is the pacing. Mm -hmm. There are there right. are a number of scenes where uh, there's lots of wordless staring by characters as other people are doing <laughs> things on screen, like long long shots of Tasha Yar's expression as you know Troy's emoting in the corner. Or something, and uh, mm. or long special effects views, and and I'm incredible as I read later that the producers thought this this episode was too fast paced, and they needed to create more scenes to pad out the running time. And I'm thinking, too fast paced. There was, I mean, it just it just didn't seem fast paced to me in that sense. Part, no, partly. Mm -hmm. Partly, I think it's because TV has become faster paced and is more tightly edited now than it was in nineteen in the nineteen eighties. But also, I think part of it is because they're showing off because it's a premiere. They're showing off what they can do, and they are therefore using the characters on screen as surrogates, going, "Oh wow, this is so amazing." As right. surrogates for the audience, and they did the same thing in in the cage in the original Star Trek pilot, where we commented on how when the ship goes to warp for the first time, it's this enormously long sequence, <laughs> right? Because it's the first time. That's true. That's true. You going to say, Father Corey? Uh, I was just going to say, if if they thought this was fast paced, I'd hate to see what they thought a slow episode would be like. <laughs> I know. Um, because it, I mean, just the fact that. 
you know, Riker gets onto the, the battle bridge of the Enterprise for the first time oh, yes. and then sits there for 30 seconds watching a replay of the first half <laughs> of the first episode. It's just yeah. like, yeah. I, I, I had a note, by the way, about that, which is, wow, someone had the time to edit the encounter with Q into a nice little video presentation for Riker to watch later. Like, it was, exactly. this, it was and, and very they, strange. And they, and they imply in the next scene when he goes into the captain's ready room that this is that it took him like 45 minutes or something to watch all of that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right, it was... right. It was like a time compression of some sort. Yeah, it was very it was a very it was. I mean, why wouldn't you just have, like say, hey, you know, Tasha, take him to the ready to the briefing room and brief him on what happened and have that all happen mm -hmm. off screen. Like why? I just, that was a very weird directing choice to me. I guess I, I just, it feels I, like I, one of those scenes that needed to be added to pad out the time. Yeah, yeah it, you're it, right. I may be mistaken about this, but it may be that that's right after the highway, the halfway point, and that's their way of backfilling mm. the audience on what happened in the first part if you didn't see the first part. Right, right. Because did it air as two separate episodes, or did it well, air? It, it, I think it aired as one, but it was with the idea this is later in syndication going to be shown in two parts. Right, right. And so they oh, need okay. to have some kind of last time on Star Trek The Next Generation to let you know if you missed the one, the first part, what happened in it. Right, because that's actually what it looked like was a previously on star trek the next generation yeah. and then Riker gets to watch that uh for, with us um yeah. <laughs> so uh kind of jumping back to the beginning I, I did notice one thing is that the that opening sequence uh where mm -hmm. we zoom in on the enterprise right to a window where we see picard standing there framed perfectly in the window uh looking mm -hmm. very uh, uh stern uh, was actually reminded me a lot of how both the cage and where no man has gone before begin, which is an exterior mm -hmm. zoom in to the bridge uh, shot. Right. So I just thought that was a very interesting, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it was seemingly and an in, homage. And in the opening credits, we have a tweak of the familiar next, a couple of tweaks of the familiar next generation or original series credits. Instead of its five-year mission, we now have its continuing mission. Right. And instead of where no man has gone before, it's now where no one has gone before. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. We we get it. We're, we're updating for the for the eighties. And and then at the end of the credits, we have start date four one one five three point seven. Uh, which tells us we're way farther along in time now because right. now we've got five digit star dates instead of four digit star dates. Right. And with and when we see an elderly McCoy later, that gives us a sense of I think cause did they actually say that his yeah, age? They, they, 137. 137. Yeah. Which so, to me seems too young for him. If this is eighty years later, he was not in his forties, you know, in the original series. <laughs> he certainly didn't look it, unless the DeForest Kelly has had a rough life. Well, I, I think point. we've talked about this before, but wasn't there something about how originally this was supposed to be a hundred years after and the that original series, and then they compressed it to eighty? Yeah, and that would make more sense because I mean, even by our standards, he 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 had I don't know what DeForest Kelly's real age was, but he looked like he was at least in his fifties. And you got to think by the 23rd century, it's people are going to age slower than they do now, at least somewhat. So he should have been, I don't know, 60s or 70s when the, so the original Kelly series was, was born set. in 1920. So 1967, he was 47. He would have been almost late, 50. late 40s. Yeah. Wow. That makes me feel really old. <laughs> i'm Notice older than mccoy it, was wow. it's the same thing in doctor who where william hartnell was only 56 but wow did he seem older people just seem mm -hmm. people aged faster back then yeah i guess yeah i mean and well i can't imagine what i would look like uh back then uh i wonder too if 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 uh stage makeup and all that stuff made you look older on screen uh too if you had any bit of wrinkling or aging it might maybe the makeup and the lights but it sure seemed yeah. i mean it, yeah there there has been a general youthification you know mm -hmm. that's been happening but certainly if that's if that's the case if he was born in 1920 then you know 80 plus years from uh from the original series yeah, it would have been would have been right mm -hmm. yeah would have been pretty close um so one of the things they did, they did in this was instead of introducing all of the new cast at once, they sort of split it up into, uh, you know, here's here's a bunch of people 
and we'll show you the rest a little later in the episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. We see Riker, uh, the Crushers, and um, and Jordy uh, at Farpoint Station once we get there after the encounter with Q, which is interesting. And, mm-hmm. and despite the painfulness of those scenes, the decision to not introduce the entire cast at once actually works on a writing right. level. Right. <clears throat> because otherwise, and they have they had a ridiculously large ensemble cast to begin with. For yes. Star Trek: The Next Generation, um, I mean, things really got better when Troy left, and we had one less character. To, I mean, Tasha. when uh, Tasha left, and we got had one mm-hmm. less character to deal with. Um, but introducing here are these eight new people, <laughs> and the villain, yeah. and the subvillain. Remember their know, names; who, there'll be a test at the end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that would have been that would have been too much exposition all at the front. Now, because this show had already been sold, like this is not a we need to create a pilot in order to sell the the, the studio or a network on it. Because this was we're, we're producing this, um, they they is, they decided to focus on or to spend a lot more time on building up the characters' backstories. So we get a lot of exposition about who these people are, a lot more mm-hmm. than we did in the pilot episodes that they did for the original series. Um, yeah. By the end of this, we know a lot about these characters uh, for for our first episode. Um, you know, we, so we get Picard, and he's again he's more stern than he eventually becomes. Like everybody, their 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 edges get rounded over time. I mean, that's just mm-hmm, a natural yeah. aspect of this. Um, but I gotta say, one of the worst first episodes is getting this is Troy's. Like she was. Yeah. She was bad. She looked like she she looked like she was ready to burst into tears like the entire time of the episode. <laughs> yeah, yes. she looked until terrified. The, well, even at the end, even at the end when she was oh happiness and joy, <laughs> and she still looked like she was ready to burst into tears. I, I feel think she did. joy. Well, Marina Sirtis would later on talk about how joy. she watched she watched this episode through her fingers because she felt her, she was terrible in it, so she recognized yeah. it. Joy and gratitude. And just to prove that, I'm going to say it twice for you, the audience. Joy <laughs> and, and gratitude. <laughs> yeah. Man, she oh, also man. had this this very heavy accent of some sort, which sounded... Which is not hers. Not hers, right. It, it sounded vaguely Russian or something. Um, it, was, it was kind of an odd accent. Data mm-hmm. is uh, immediately, or and not Data, as Dr. Uh, uh, Pulaski will insist in calling him, but Data... <laughs> Is immediately pegged as the naive walking computer. Um, yeah, he's a bit like Spock, but he's not as uh, wise as Spark, Spock. Should oh, say. and he get. By the way, there's before we get to the problems with Data in this episode. There, we should. You mentioned the way his name is pronounced because yes. um, it gets pronounced. The word in real life gets pronounced both Data and Data. Yes. And mm-hmm. there was a and they hadn't established how the character's name was going to be pronounced. And Brent Spiner, the actor, had kind of been assuming it was Data. And then Patrick Stewart walks onto the bridge and says, Mr. Data. <laughs> and it became Data from that moment forward. <laughs> and when the captain and, speaks <laughs> and and Spiner uh, has suggested, I don't know if this is true, but he suggested that it actually had an influence on real life that more people pronounce the word data today than data, mm. whereas before it might have yeah. been the reverse. I wouldn't be surprised if that were true, because, uh, th- yeah, these sorts of things have influence. Um, well, especially since most people who are dealing with data are <laughs> generally science fiction geeks. So Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So the, yeah, but wow, is is he badly written in this episode? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, he comes across as an idiot. Uh, it, 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 he has t- horrible lines like "difficult." Simply solve the mystery at Farpoint Station and <laughs> a query. The word "snoop," yeah. and it's like, dude, you're a walking thesaurus. You <laughs> well, know yeah. this word, and then he looks it up in his mental thesaurus, and it's like oh, yeah. he knows this bazillion number of synonyms, including obscure ones like gumshoe, as if that's a verb. <laughs> that, right. That's something so, I'm glad they wrote out of his character fairly quickly. Is where he would do the query. Yes, you know. that would that would have become annoying very quickly. Yeah, I mean, they sort of they tried to explain it away, where Picard says, you know. Data, how can you not ha- know a simple word like Snoop? And Data says, well, maybe it was a, a, a human behavior I was I, they didn't want me to emulate or something along those lines. 
but, but yeah, they hang but, a lantern on it. Yeah, it's just a little too. Uh, you're right. It's a, it's a little too much. They again uh, over time, Data will become a little softened. He's still an android, but he's not a, a cliche robot uh, as he mm-hmm. as he is in this one. Um, I, I do like when Riker kind of uh, encounters him on the holodeck later and says, uh, "Nice to meet you, Pinocchio." And yeah, it, which is a which is a fun little moment. In fact, I think of everybody, uh, I think Riker comes across most himself in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, he's uh-huh. the, the character we yeah. will. We, he was, he's very much like the character he will be, uh, mm-hmm. for good or for ill, I suppose. But uh, but he it's Riker uh, very much so. So uh, well, I'd argue Jordy too. his his interaction with uh, Dr. Crusher about and you'll excuse me if I haven't heard this a thousand <laughs> times. That's just Jordy. Yeah, yeah that's just how you blah, 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 you know, <laughs> that that scene is. But I think in general, Jordy comes across as a lot more tentative and a lot less self-assured than he will be later. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, I would. I might argue that he his he the actor. Um, um, Jordy, LeVar Burton. LeVar Burton. LeVar Burton was probably the most the best known to yes. a general audience coming yeah. into this uh, because he had been in roots and- right because he'd been in roots and so i think um it's an it's just interesting to note that he would that of all the cast he would have been the best known of of everyone to to the to the to the general public watching it mm. um so uh we could we could kind of talk about people as we go along. I mean, for for me, uh, Jim, you've made this point before. When we talked about an overview of Next Gen was Worf and Yar were were redundant. They, yeah, they, you they don't were, need both. They were both you know both aggressive, um, both you know come from cultures in which violence was a norm, etc. I, I, they I was a little over the top. Her her outburst during the courtroom scene where oh yeah you should, you should be, get. Down get down knees. on your knees to what the federation is yeah, yeah. It, it 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 was it was again too much uh, you know it was it, they they went they went like one one level too high on yeah. on that one a moat meter uh for but, that. but with her super patriotism it's kind of nice to see a definitely republican female character in science fiction <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> so um uh, so then we get. What, by the way, one one thing about the redundancy with Worf and Tasha is at this point, Worf was not meant to be a regular character. Um, he was originally just going to be set dressing. It's just, it's just there's yeah. that Klingon on the bridge, and he wasn't going to be. He wasn't going to have the the prominent role he later came to have. Right. right. He would have been like O'Brien was in this episode or um, Nurse Chapel yeah. was in the original series, an occasional speaking part, yep. but not regular. Um, OK, so uh, we have this encounter with Q. He shows up on the bridge first in in an outlandish uh, what four, uh, what, four. So 400 years from from now, from right or was so about the 1600s, uh, mm-hmm. a ship captain speaking yeah. in Elizabethan English. Um, oh, but before that, he's put the Tholian web up in front of the ship, <laughs> right? And they're right. they're flying towards the Tholian web, and they're talking about how they're about to crash into it, and the alarm is blaring, and how disastrous it's going to be if they crash into it. And Picard's first order is shut off that noise, not <laughs> yeah. stop the ship. <laughs> to me, to me, stop the ship from crashing into that thing would take higher priority than shut off that noise. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, he has the controls right there in his chair, as we later find out from Wesley. Uh, I don't know why he doesn't do it himself. Um, so uh, Q shows up and he says, you've come far enough. You know, go back to where you came from. And that's one of the things they, first, they said for us is that far point is on the edge of explored space. Right. Um, and, and that's where, the Starfleet is about to head out into new territories to explore. Um, and so Q is beyond, right. beyond Deneb four, which is like 2,600 light years away. Right. Uh, which should have taken, you know, we won't get into the, the, their, how they mess with <laughs> time and distance. Um, so then he shows, then he looks like a, a, a Marine officer of the, say maybe the forties and fifties. Maybe you know, I don't think they were still in the sixties. It might have been the '60s, but it might. It, it, I think that uniform wasn't in use by the '80s anyway. Um, yeah, 
It was and, meant to be kind of nostalgic. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he kind of draw as an American draw about, you know, we have to, you have to get the commies or whatever, which in the eighties was still somewhat relevant, I suppose. Uh, right. That, that kind mm-hmm. of uh, talk. Um, but he says uh, 400, you know, at one point he says 400 years before that, you were still murdering each other in quarrels over tribal God images, a line which gets repeated in the Riker briefing video, by the way. Um, this, so it means that it, it felt like they were emphasizing that. And, and to me, what was, what are they referring to? They're referring to the reformation, uh, mm. which, which is that mm-hmm. time period, um, the wars of religion, the wars of religion. Right. And, and it's, it's evidence of Roddenberry's hostility toward organized religion. I mean, we, we've, we've talked yeah. about it before and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's apparent and we'll note it, you know, and that's just part of the way, the way things are. But, uh, I like how Q freezes the guy who stands up, who's like one of numerous. It's really, it's fascinating when you watch this episode, if you count the number of people who move in and out of bridge stations yes. to, to keep the man when the main cast moves. Mm-hmm. It's like there's this huge number of rotating people just standing by <laughs> to sub in for a regular cast member. But one of them stands up in a kind of, I guess, threatening way to Q and he freezes the guy. And then Q, when the captain says, you didn't have to do that, Q says, well, he could have been, ca- would you allow yourself to be captured helpless by humans? And it's like, you're implying you can be captured helpless by humans? What? Really? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and and in, uh, yeah, that's he, he doesn't kill him, but he freezes him, and they're able to revive him in sick bay, apparently uh, off screen. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and and then Q refers to us as a dangerous, savage child race. Yes, which is a line like straight out of Plan Nine from Outer Space. Your ancient <laughs> juvenile minds. <laughs> At another point, he refers to us as a uh, as a primates and and other things like that. So they, they, Q uh, leaves the bridge and uh, they decide to, this was a bit confusing. They decide to go through this saucer separation in at order warp. to, at warp, to sort of throw off Q. Yeah, it, they, they don't explain it well, but what they're yeah. hoping to do, if you watch it carefully, is surprise Q. Because he's, they've, they've started right. heading away from the Tholian web and Q is following them as a ball of energy. And they're, they want to detach the saucer and get all of the people to safety so they can turn around with the, with the, the bird part of the ship and attack him using the battle bridge. Right. Yeah, they call it the star drive section. Yep. Um, yeah. Apparently, the, the saucer has warp capability of its own. I mean, there's, there's, they don't really talk about it in this, but it would have to in order to meet up at Deneb 4 with the star drive section, the warp drive section um, later on. It was, it was, it was, it's fuzzy. They only ever do the separation twice more in the, uh, mm-hmm. in the series. Mm-hmm. They do it in an episode called Arsenal of Freedom. And then they do it in Best of Both Worlds, which, which is uh, the, the Locutus of Borg. Uh, they also do it in one of the movies, don't they? In, in Generations. Uh, generations. Yeah, yeah. When they destroy the Enterprise, uh, basically. <laughs> The, yeah, the, the, and the, the the idea had always been that they could do this in the original series. We just never saw it. Yeah, one of the things is that it's because it basically stops the action. You know, just mm-hmm. the separation just it, – it's it, it takes too long, and this, it doesn't provide enough benefit to the story. Right. Um, that's, why, that's why they hype the drama this time, both at the front and the back end. At the front end, by doing it at warp, not recommended at any warp speed, Captain. Yes. And, and then they hype it again at the end, where like a total passive-aggressive jerk, <laughs> Picard makes, makes Riker manually redock with the saucer section. And it's like everyone's yeah. going, ooh, that is so dangerous. Yeah, um, the, the whole man- – well, first – I, it, to me, it sounded like Picard wanted to test the new first officer. What, what's he made mm-hmm. of? You know, how does he handle the pressure? But the whole like manual redocking, it, it didn't seem all that difficult. Like Riker just kind of says, you know, a couple of lines, you know, you know, thrusters, thrusters at station keeping. Okay, a little more. All right, we're done. Like, yeah, that yeah. wasn't that hard. Well, and if, <laughs> and and if manual, it, there wasn't somebody out there cranking down the locks as it. <laughs> Connects. Yeah. I mean, it was still all done by computer control, but it was just adjusting the yeah. pitch and yaw. Right. And and if it were really as dangerous as everyone was making out, you would never do that as a test for your officer. Mm-hmm. This, I mean, this thing 
I mean, imagine taking that kind of risk with an aircraft carrier. You're risking millions or billions of dollars in damage. Right. You know, based on what your first officer does. Yeah. I mean, I could see where a captain would say, hey, you know, I want you to dock the carrier, uh, you know, uh, at, at, at you know Newport News, whatever, you know, that that sort of thing. But in a normal procedure, like they give them a normal procedure to do. But I don't know. Yeah. It's, you know, I suppose. Um one of the things we'd see a lot of in this episode is several times uh, where we see crew running through the corridors. Uh, the only time yep. we ever see men wearing skirts uh, in yep. the in this <laughs> on the Enterprise, uh, I think. And there, there are many there there are many skirts just like the women would wear, like Lieutenant Uhura's mini skirt. Yes, yes, they were they were not attractive, and I'm glad that they ended up doing away with it. If there were kilts, it would be another thing. If there was like kilts, a, would be another thing. A Scottish starship <laughs> would be awesome. Uh, you know, just a uh, starship uh, with just Scotsmen on board. Yeah, uh, but with really good artificial gravity at all times. <laughs> yes. yes. We don't want things to fly up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah, your kilt is up again. Um, we do get, uh, speaking of Irish, which I wasn't, um, we get Ch Chief O'Brien is in this one. I forgot that he that Cole Meany was in this oh, episode. Oh, yeah. And in fact, and he, he was, he's in the command section in this. And in fact, he is one of the very few of the non-main cast who are in both the first episode and the last episode of Next Generation, uh, which is very interesting. Mm. This, it also happens to be one of those um, background bridge officers who's always – we always see this like some of the same faces. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's one of those guys, and he's, he's also uh, in both the first and last episode. So good for him for staying employed as an actor. Uh, <laughs> through that whole time. Um, so then we have this courtroom scene with Q. Um, and, and, and I just, I, I don't want to actually, I don't want to go through the whole story step by step because it's not really yeah. worth it. But, but the courtroom scene is, is, is semi important because it comes up again at the end of the series. Yeah. Q is like a 21st century judge, late 21st century judge after an atomic Holocaust. And you have this kind of Mad Max like environment, apparently, <laughs> right. with all these colorful characters hooting and hollering for the Enterprise crew to be judged. And and you've got these guys who are the doped out soldiers from the future in the really implausible plushy battle armor, <laughs> right. um, who are like snorting cocaine from little things in their in their uniform and firing off machine guns that are strapped to their arms. Yeah, they waste and a lot of uh, a lot of ammo in that. <laughs> a lot of ammo, and given how capricious the judge is and how violent the guards are, it's like man, if I was living in this post apocalyptic world. I would like never go and sit in the gallery at a court. I mean, it's just yeah, no way too dangerous. Anything could happen to you in there. It is not worth the entertainment value. Yeah, it was Mad Max beyond Thunderdome. I mean, well, as I put it, the, the the production design brief for the court would have been Mary Poppins meets the King and I meets Mad Max. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you had the the the, the strange, uh, you had the guys in the Asian uh, outfits, um, mm -hmm. including the. Uh, the uh, uh, little person with the bell. Um, I don't know what Q's getup was supposed to be. Like, we had no idea of, like, what country or culture it was. And it's I think just, that yeah. was kind of the point, though. It was such, it was a time when things were just completely disorganized in the, the, in, in the world because right. of this post-apocalyptic time. Yeah. By the way, talking about one of the guys in the Asian getup, uh, the bailiff was Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa. Yeah. Now, you know him. Because mm -hmm. he was in Mortal Kombat, he was in Man of the High Castle, and he was the Japanese father in Lost, the New Lost in Space. Right, right. And it's he the was the same actor. Was he the trade minister in uh, Man of the High Castle? Yes, yes. He oh, is. he's trade minister to go to Comey. Really? Yes, it's the same actor. Wow. Yes. Wow. That's right. I, I, I saw, saw him. him. It's like yeah. he looks familiar, and it, yeah, well, that's that's who it is. So, oh, of course, that's this awesome. would have been, I think, fairly early. When this episode was was done, he would have been fairly early in his career. Oh yeah, yeah, this was thirty this, years ago. You know, but yeah, that was same same guy. That's awesome. One of the things I find interesting about the court and Picard is such he's so passive aggressive through all of this, but it really comes out in court because the the guards demand that the prisoners sit, and. And they have such a huge, defiant show of standing 
<laughs> just to, just to defy the court. And it's mm -hmm. like, this is the hill you want to die on? <laughs> I mean, you just surrendered to the guy back on the Enterprise in the dramatic, breathtaking, what? A Starfleet captain surrenders at the first moment because he, <laughs> he knows that they have no chance of winning. And then you get all haughty about, I'm going to stand and not sit in order to comply with the court's orders? Yeah, it... it, it... I mean, I suppose there's a prisoner should never cooperate as much as possible with the with the, mm -hmm. those who've taken them, you know, prisoner. But you're right. I mean, it's, some of that was was sheer posturing on their part. Um, I, I mean, some of the interaction was was good Star Trek in the sense of sort of establishing this is who we are as Starfleet, as the Federation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we stand for, and and in one sense. That was that that was good for this episode to say this is what the next generation is going to be about. Where the these principles that Starfleet stands for, that the Federation, you know, that we've, you know, you know, whether for good or for ill, Roddenberry's whole idea of you know humanity is perfected and we've moved beyond base, um, ag you know, aggression and and that sort of stuff, which frankly ends yeah, up making we, for, makes we have not moved TV. on. <laughs> we have not moved beyond passive aggression, however. <laughs> right, right. Passive aggression is now the primary means of conflict in the future of Starfleet. Um, yeah, and then Tasha gets frozen and defrozen, uh, yeah, an unfrozen caveman security chief. Uh, and, and then, then when Q winks them back onto the battle bridge, and by the way, the battle bridge is a cool concept, so yes, I like that. Mm -hmm. I do like that. Um, but O'Brien is sitting there, even though he doesn't yet have a name, and gets one of the most clunky lines in the whole thing. He says, out of nowhere, after all these people have suddenly reappeared, know anything about Farpoint Station? Sounds like a rather dull place. Well, the, yeah. I, oh. the, I, the idea is supposed to be that um, Q has arranged it so that the, the, the people back on the Enterprise don't realize that something has happened. That only those who were taken to the court uh, re will remember, I think, is the idea. But, but you're he's right. He, he's been talking about, ooh, this station ahead of you is going to make an excellent test for a long time by this point. That who has? Q. Uh, Q. Right. But but I think the idea is that that uh, O'Brien doesn't is, is had his memory of Q white. I think that's what they're wow. trying to convey. Well, they yeah, don't I, convey it well. Yeah, no, it's they clunky. Don't. But I, I kind of agree with Dom on that. Because it, 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 he was just sitting there doing his little thing on the console and just kind of looks around and what's going on. Eh, right. nothing. Yeah, no, no. Oh, Captain, where have you been? <laughs> or anything yeah. like that, you know? Yeah. Um. So they, they have you know, a... Well, even when the captain says, you know, what what's our course? Well, of course we're going to Farpoint. He's just yes. like... Nothing's changed. Yeah, still far point. No, uh, is there a reason we don't have the uh, saucer section? Uh, yeah, chief? exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. So they they get to far point, and the I had to say. Um. So I was watching the Netflix version. They've cleaned up the special effects a lot. Um. Mm -hmm. Obviously, watching this in the pre HD days, uh, it, the those effects would have been a lot muddier. Um. This looks very clear, and and in fact, mm -hmm. um. It's it's a very interesting that they they have a miniature that they're using for Farpoint. I noticed, uh, mm -hmm. not CGI, and uh, it, which actually the miniature shows up on screen, right? You, oh, right. Uh, yeah. In in Zorn's I think it office, is probably the actual yeah the actual miniature. I think is what they used as the the set piece <laughs> in his office. Right, right. The architectural three uh, uh, D rendering of, of, of yep. if you want. Um, so the far point story itself, it's just it's not again, it's just not a very plausible idea that yeah. oh, this backwards culture that lives in these mud huts have built this <laughs> advanced star base that's perfect for Starfleet and it's empty and ready to use. Here you go. And and they can't make any more for <laughs> anywhere else that we might want them. This is right. the only one they can make. Right. That's not suspicious at all. <laughs> and then stuff just miraculously appears if you want it, you know. Right. And I mean, like to their credit, apple. yeah, to their credit, Starfleet is suspicious of this. I mean, it's it may be too good to be true, but it maybe it's not. Maybe it maybe it's true. So let's go send the Enterprise to go check it out. But it's still like it's still kind of weak. I have to say, yeah, um, <laughs> it's badly executed. One thing I like though is when Doctor Crusher goes to quote unquote do some shopping in the kind of market they have there. And when she buys a bolt of cloth, she says, 
charge it to Dr. Crusher, implying <laughs> they have money. Yes. <laughs> right. Unlike what we will, uh, will Picard will later say when we rescue the 20th century uh, humans from Earth uh, in suspended animation, uh, that we've done away with uh, money. Uh, so, also, yeah. uh, also notice that Picard, apparently, when they get into orbit, and he like calls Jordy, who at this point is the navigator, not even the chief engineer. He calls Jordy instead of his first officer, and has the navigator round people up for beam up. So here's Jordy is yeah. the one who comes to Riker and says, "Ooh, the ship's in orbit." So here's what I'm thinking: is, is you know what you probably have is you've established a, a, a some kind of Starfleet outpost. People have to stand watch at the outpost, and mm -hmm. so he co Picard contacts the outpost, the the office and whoever the officer of the deck is say and he goes the, the problem with that is is they never do that any at any other time they they just call right. directly to the communicator of the person they want to talk to so yeah. it's it's very clearly a, just an opportunity to introduce Jordy, have him interact right. with Riker and then have Riker kind of be kind of like a jerk to him and make him make a formal report. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be, that'd be plausible if there was something like, well, before the Enterprise can communicate with Riker's comm badge, the comm badge needs to be logged into the Enterprise, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. There are IT and rules. They like, have, have absolutely to nothing them. like that. They have absolutely <laughs> nothing like that at right. all. It's just yeah. all of a sudden the comm badge works. The Enterprise is in orbit and now it works. Yeah. Well, they they that's actually thinking way more technical technically competently than the writers of this series at this point exactly. because <laughs> later they have the enterprise and in, get infected by a computer virus and the writers don't even know the word virus <laughs> <laughs> right what i forget what that they say uh, yeah a data pattern thing yes. yeah well in the 24th century they they call it something else now right right and, yeah and sure. apparently have no virus <laughs> software i did notice that the uh they don't have the final transporter effect for this episode. I don't know if you noticed that. It's much mm. slower and it's and it's much more sparkly, uh, more akin to what we saw in, in the uh, the motion picture, Star Trek the motion picture, right. than to what we get eventually. But uh, but the the transporter effect is still preliminary in this, which is I thought was interesting. Um, hmm. Then we have this this famous discussion between Riker and Picard on uh, the status of captains on away missions, which is that. Captains aren't aren't allowed to go on away missions. Only the first officer, if there's any danger. If there's danger, right, 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 right. right. If you're just yeah. going down on a diplomatic uh, uh, meeting, uh, and which just, uh, which which is them addressing one of the criticisms of the original show, because no military commanding officer would have been allowed mm -hmm. to behave the way Kirk did. <laughs> right, right. The, the cowboy Kirk. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's. So it's it's interesting that they have this, and because they've clearly decided that the producers that Riker is the action hero guy, mm -hmm. Picard is the cerebral authority figure, uh, and and they've split split it in the in those means. We also get um, a, a bit over the top of Picard's lack of affinity for children. Um, mm. It's established here that he doesn't really like kids, and it becomes a thing. That he overcomes eventually, I, I, you know, with that um, sort of sort of um, we we also get the uh, the um, the the concomitant um, Wesley Crusher uh, beam. Let's beam him into a wall beginning uh, way. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Will Wheaton, but yeah, it was way over over uh, overdone. His excitement, his his enthusiasm, his wide eyed uh you know, boy about the universe uh, thing. And then the fact he knows like everything about this brand new state of the art ship. Yeah. <laughs> that whose plans are classified. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who, yeah his mom's going to be in big trouble. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, by the way, one thing they establish in one of the shots of the bridge that this ship, like the original enterprise, as we saw in the cage has a sunroof. Mm -hmm. um, yes. where you're, we get an upshot of it this time and we can see the stars through the sunroof. Right. right. Although sometimes I wondered, is it really a sunroof or is it just like a painting of stars, which is a stupid idea, but like, <laughs> yeah. you don't need a painting of stars on the roof there. To, you know, it, it, it would be in the soffit, you know, yeah, they have a soffit in the uh, bridge. <laughs> um, we get this other scene of uh, DeForest Kelly, who apparently uh, t was aboard the Enterprise on the way out during the whole Q episode, 
and uh, is returning to Earth on the Hood, the ship that brought Riker and those guys. Um, and we have him with this nice moment of sort of a passing the baton mm-hmm. uh, from the original crew to yeah. the next gen crew with Data. It- and and this is a classic thing when you have a spinoff to have someone from the original series show up in the pilot episode just to wish them luck. It's yeah. it's kind of a cliche. Yeah, and it was it was a late addition to the show. I mean, this was yeah. um, uh, uh, they they did this very late in the production. And uh, a little bit of trivia: this was DeForest Kelly's final television appearance before his death in 1999, hmm. uh, which is interesting. He, he he actually you know made. Uh, did they? Was there one more? There was at least one or two more Star Trek movies, I think, at this yeah. point uh, that he was in. But as far as on TV, this was his last appearance. Hmm. Um, By the way, there's a there's an interesting scene where they're on the bridge and Troy is talking, and so we have the meeting of Troy and Riker, and they have the whole Imzadi telepathy. Oh, Do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> blah blah blah, which is just recycled Decker and Ilea. Right. <laughs> um but uh and and like Picard doesn't seem to notice the long silences as they're talking to each other telepathically. Well everybody apparently um, stands there staring at stuff for long periods of time, so it's not new. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> but but at one point, um I forget who she's talking to, but I have it in my notes that Troy is explaining my father was a Starfleet officer, and she's in. Yeah. She's explaining her mixed heritage, right? So she, you know, she's half Betazoid, half human, My and she explains was, that uh, by yeah, saying, "Grappler, it was yeah. a yeah. Grappler Zorn," and Sorry. and and she says, "My father was a Starfleet officer." So wait, what? Betazoids can't be Starfleet officers, or that's Beta Z and, was and, not and, yet in the Federation. Well, but no, I mean, it just the way it comes off. I mean, right. you're you're head cannoning too quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the just taking the statement at its face value. Right. She, she, she like, I'm not a full Betazoid. I'm only an empath, and I'm not a full Betazoid because my father right. was a Starfleet officer. Implying Betazoids can't be Starfleet officers. Who knew Starfleet was so racist? And apparently, <laughs> Troy only got in because she's a half breed. It's right. like we'll take half Betazoids, but not Betazoids. It, right. I, yeah. I mean, she said, uh, "My mother was Betazoid. My father was a, was a Starfleet officer, not not a human Starfleet officer, not right. human." Yeah. Right. It, that was an odd odd construction that they they. It felt like they had they were they were gonna fill out some kind of backstory that never got filled out. It was a mm-hmm. it was a weird. Just say my mother was Betazoid. My father was human. I mean, why not right. say that? Um, yeah. well, I mean, we eventually do get the backstory, which is that her father was stationed on Beta Z, and that's yeah. where he met. And, and we meet a we meet a hologram of her father and stuff, but that's not in this episode. Right, right. No. Uh, but apparently, that was in the the writer's bible, and yeah. someone just phrased it badly. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Grappler Zorn, yes. At one point during the during as as the giant pink space jellyfish is blowing stuff up, <laughs> yes. Um, th- Picard phones Riker and says, um, I-, "I want you to help me in an illegal act. We're going to kidnap Zorn and bring him up here." Right. And and it's like, okay, this guy has been begging for your help. Why not just say, come up to the ship with us? <laughs> right. um, and and then as part of their kidnapping plot, they go to his office and find him like cowering under his table or something and ask him a question. And he doesn't want to answer. And Riker says, well, if we can learn nothing from you, we'll leave. And they turn around and start to walk out. It's like, wait, you were just going to kidnap this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at one point, uh, Zorn threatens to uh, give the base to the Ferengi instead of the, the Federation. And Picard responds by suggesting that the Ferengi eat other sentient beings like they, yeah. you know, they consume their last like. Like, Hope they find you just as tasty. Yeah, there's. So, I mean, clearly they had a very different Ferengi race in mind. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I was reading that the writers re- very quickly realized that the Ferengi just could not be the main enemy of the Federation. Uh, yeah. In this series, because they just were not at all interesting in that way. Mm. Um, also, also notice that as the giant space jellyfish crisis is unfolding. Picard decides that's the moment 
to to leave the bridge and go down to sick bay and apologize to Crusher for being rude to her. <laughs> and yeah. and then in, invite her to get the hell off of his ship. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is the time to have that conversation, really? Well, apparently he was being trying to be nice to her because maybe he reminds her of her dead husband. But yes, uh <laughs> not the time to have that conversation. And and see he puts his foot in it really what really good with her. That's 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 yeah. very true. He just he comes across completely awkward. He does. I mean, absolutely no person interpersonal yeah. skills whatsoever. Not even with children, just at all. And how yeah, he right. became a captain with being this <laughs> la- having this lack of interpersonal skills is a shock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also notice in it it turns out that Crusher has requested this assignment on the yes. Enterprise and she doesn't mm-hmm. say because this is the flagship or anything like that. That has not been established that the Enterprise is the flagship. So all the all the audience knows is Picard was apparently I mean he was the guy who brought her husband's body back to her and Wesley. Mm-hmm. He maybe was her, her husband's commanding officer or something. They at least served or together friend. and her yeah. and, yeah, and her really husband dies. Yeah. yeah, they don't they don't they don't tell us exactly what happened, but then she requests the assignment with this guy. Yeah. And and that's all we know. And this is this has kind of a creepy vibe. I mean I, I don't know that it's necessarily like it, it has to be creepy. I mean <clears throat> we don't know that she blames him or whatever happened. I mean, mm-hmm. he could have no like, her I, husband. I, I, and so I, I, maybe I don't she, think she does. It's like she prefers yeah. the strong horse. Well, I mean, as fans, what do we know? The Enterprise is always the best ship. That's I mean, that's that we know that as fans. I mean, that's sort of established mm-hmm. is the Enterprise is the best ship in the fleet. And that's going to be what right. the new Enterprise is. And so I could see why the Enterprise would be attractive as the best ship would be attractive for, for people to request the duty there. So I never, I didn't find that to be odd. Mm-hmm. Um, I found right, uh, Picard's sort of trying to get rid of her odd, given that she traveled all the way to the edge of known universe yeah. to, to be on the ship. And now he's telling her to get off. I mean, that seemed a bit odd. Um, yeah. You could have done it before. Um, so yes, that, that was weird. Um, there is one fun moment where Data, they're walking around in the tunnels, quote unquote, the innards of the space alien. And uh, Data's like talking about something and he stops and goes, I'm sorry, I seem to be commenting on everything. I'll stop yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that was nice. That is perfect because, yes, that is that that is the writer's crutch is having the like Data uh, explain everything in, in exposition for the audience's sake. So I just thought that was a uh, very meta. That was a good a good moment. Yeah. That uh, was nice. There are a couple of weird directorial choices. Uh, at a couple mm-hmm. points, um, the director has the camera as the point of view of a character. So when Wesley comes to the bridge, oh, he right. has the camera point of view being Wesley walking on the bridge, and, and it was just jarring because it mm-hmm. was it was it wasn't this isn't an, a normal thing for the rest of the episode. It was a it's such a few odd moments like that. Um, I mean, it was then, it was kind of jarring, but it was it was kind of a, a effective way to to show the scale of the bridge, you know, to show that, you know, you think of the the Enterprise bridge from the original series. It's a yeah. fairly small area. Yeah. But then you get onto this galaxy class and you've got, you know, the living room and acres. the dining room put together, you know, <laughs> we're going to put the credenza over there on that wall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um. So the other thing in that we have in this episode is the f- episode is the uh, first appearance of the holodeck, uh, mm-hmm. where Riker goes in to, to find uh, and and apparently although it it had been uh, it had appeared in an animated episode, but it wasn't right. exploited the way it will be now with constant mm-hmm. breakdowns. <laughs> right, yeah. it's a, a constant source of stories storylines for writers, um, and apparently that the Enterprise's holodecks are more advanced than anything else out there at the time because Riker is astonished at the fidelity uh, of, right. of the recreation of the simulation. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's an interesting establishment of, of this set that we will see a lot. Well, per- and personally, I, that it wasn't just holographic, you know, that they make the point of things like the leaves and things were basically reproduced by transporter technology. Right. Within right. the holodeck. 
Yeah, I I I I find it really kind. Of, it's it's a kind of an annoying cliche to me how the everything they want the audience to be impressed with they have to have the characters be impressed mm-hmm. with so that yeah. the audience has it telegraphed this is impressive <laughs> and it's like come on these people grew up in this century can't they take anything for granted right right <laughs> like you like the whole um like, uh the, the find my friends uh <laughs> On the starship where they where they yeah, have to show Riker yeah. how to find data on which that's that's so amazing. It's not like they had phones that would do that four hundred years ago, <laughs> yeah. well, and we never see that again. Like they never they never show that in use uh, ever again. What they what they eventually do is they tap their communicator computer. Where is Commander Data? Yeah, yep. Commander Data is on Holodeck Four, and they go there. I mean, that's just it's funny. Yeah, um, uh, so. Um, so when we get to the end of the episode, they the the they 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 don't blast free the jellyfish that's trapped on the planet. They like direct re- and, energy. And you, you, yeah, they use the phaser array to direct energy to it so that it can absorb the energy and heal. And how they knew that that was going to work with this life form they've only just discovered and it's injured, I don't know, but. Um, but they recharge the transporter jellyfish that's down on on the planet, and then it comes floating up, and we get these slow two thousand and one space child, you know, soft focus <laughs> images of the two giant transporter space jellyfish stroking each other's tendrils. <laughs> um, Hence the PG thirteen rating. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. And well, and it's interesting. One of them is pink, and one of them is blue. Only. In the new special effects, in the original uh, broadcast, they were both blue, a hazy blue. In fact, okay. like, they, were, right. they were very That's fuzzy. Right. Again, it was not as pre HD, mm-hmm. but yes, the, they were. Um, uh, they were not boy girl as they later made them in explicitly in the re- reimagined. I'm, I'm surprised they. I'm surprised they did that in the remastered version because that's even. It's like. Wow, with the racism of the you can't be a Starfleet <laughs> officer if you're a Betazoid, and now we're imposing gender stereotypes yeah. on space jellyfish. <laughs> Nobody wants to work with Betazoids. <laughs> they cry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing is, uh, hopefully the Enterprise stuck around a little bit and didn't just fly off like we did at the end and, and kind of helped the, the poor uh, ba- bandy people who are in the city that got blasted to bits. <laughs> well, you know, from by the space uh, it's jellyfish. Yeah, they, uh, they had kind of the the one line of, you know, yeah, the, the Federation will send help. And that's literally <laughs> yeah. kind of how they left it. Yeah, I know we're on the edge of space. So it'll probably take weeks for them to get here, but we got more important things to do. So you'll be OK. Just slap a Band-Aid on that. We'll, you know, yeah. wait till they yeah. get here. <laughs> and then, then we get down to Picard's final lines where. I, you know, one of the characters says to him, oh, I hope all of our adventures won't be like that. And then he says, oh, no, I'm sure most will be much more interesting. <laughs> and and it's like, that's such a terrible line. But it's like so true in a way that Gene Roddenberry didn't mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Ironically, that's the, the one line where he finally shows personality, too. Right. Yeah. right. He actually has a personality. And, yeah. and then just like the cage, we get the final line of engage. Yes. In, in fact, um, Patrick Stewart, for a long part of the, I guess, like throughout most of this episode, thought he might get fired. Uh, he, mm-hmm. he, I think he felt like I, I'm not I'm not really getting this. This isn't my thing. And uh, and it turns you know, I mean, and of course, for many people, Picard is their favorite captain. I mean, he mm-hmm. really turns into a, a great character after this it, it's it's kind of hard because dealing with a with pilot episodes as we're doing uh last week and this week and coming up the next few weeks they're all not going to be great and so it sounds like we're really we really dislike star trek and that's not the case i mean what no, it is no we wouldn't do this podcast if we really dislike <laughs> exactly. it right i mean mm-hmm. what it is is we're just like you know we're being honest about the flaws and the good parts of of these very early episodes and once we get rolling, we're gonna, I mean, they'll, they'll still be clunkers. Let me tell you, there are plenty mm-hmm. of clunkers in seven seasons of every series. But the fact is, is you know, and, and more so maybe in some series than others like Voyager. But nevertheless, mm-hmm. there's plenty of good stuff uh, that's coming up. So so don't expect that we're that we're that we're mm-hmm. going to be like down on every episode. 
In, in fact, what we're talking about next, the pilot of Deep Space Nine, the emissary, is, I thought, a, quite a step up from Encounter Absolutely. at our point. Yes, yes. And Absolutely. One, re, one of the reasons why the three of us agree that it's our favorite uh, Star Trek series so far. So uh, any other uh, notes about this episode that either of you want to uh, address? I'm good. Uh, Oh, okay. uh, just one kind of quick thing is, I admittedly have have really never been a fan of the Enterprise D, the design of the Enterprise yeah. D. Yeah, you know, and it was kind of as we've been doing these rewatches, you know, going back to the original series and the movie and so on. It kind of struck me why the the original Enterprise is such an iconic design. You know, you can recognize from any profile right. the Enterprise, and there's a a great video. Uh, that I that was put out oh, about six months ago or so, uh, talking about how the de the design of the original Enterprise fits the rule of thirds. If you're familiar with photography, you know that. Yeah. And the golden ratio, which if you're familiar with architecture, you know that. And I just the Enterprise D feels like they took that Enterprise, stretched out the saucer section, squished the 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 secondary hull, made big yeah. nacelles, and said, "Okay, we're done." <laughs> right. Right. You know, and it's, it's just, much more organic too, like the yeah. the, the curves. It's yeah. just not a it's it's not as iconic a shape as the original right. Enterprise was, and even the and movie it, uh, Enterprise A was 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 I I think a a, a more pleasing design than D. exactly, and then it's just it, that's something that just kind of struck me as I was watching this uh, last night, and just yeah, yeah there's there's. It just it's not as good looking a design as the original Enterprise. And I yeah. and I can't claim, oh, this is, you know, bias because I like the original series more. I've watched far more Next Generation right. than I have ever watched anything from the original series. So it's just the design hmm. irks me a little bit, I guess, is the way I'm trying to say it. Yeah. Interesting. This is one where I don't have strong feelings. The different designs are, you know, I, I have slight preferences, maybe if I think about it. But to me, starships are wheels. So like they, I, they get you where you want to go. I particularly love a starship design and starships. And I, I could I could talk a whole podcast about yeah. about them. But um, I agree. My favorite enterprise is probably the one, the, the sovereign class, the Enterprise E that yes. they, they get after this one gets gets squished. Um, mm -hmm. that, that really goes back to the principles of the first one. Um, but, uh, maybe another, that hundred percent, maybe yeah. another time, maybe we'll have a podcast episode where we just talk about starships. Uh, maybe if Jimmy's <laughs> sure. <can> stand it. <laughs> so let's, let's wrap that up then. So, uh, that's it from us, uh, on, uh, encounter at Farpoint. What do you think listener of this episode of what we had to say or of encounter at Farpoint itself? Um, you can let us know by going to sqpn.com slash Trek or to the SQPN Facebook page. Just go to Facebook and search for SQPN. Leave us some feedback on the post related to this episode, or you can send us an email to trek at sqpn.com. Please go to iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, um, subscribe to the show, uh, write a review, share it with a friend, um, you know, retweet it. Put it on Facebook. Help us spread the word about this new series that we can uh, grow our audience and reach new people and grow the community. And we have a good conversation. Uh, we really do appreciate that when you help us that way. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing, as we said, Deep Space Nine's first episode, The Emissary. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Yeah, glad to be here. And thanks, Tom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, let's see what's out there. Engage. This is Don Bettinelli again. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcast you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give.